Are you ready to unlock the secrets of healthy aging and longevity? Then this episode is for you. News article, right? <laughs> the beginning, and then it's, it just collects dust, right? And people will use the knowledge, of course, to move it forward. But usually, the, the last sentence of the paper is that we, with this, we could, you know, solve this and that problem, right? But the traditional part is never really done, and then that's the re the reason is because there's no no incentive for an academic researcher to to translate anything because you know you as an academic you judge by the high impact papers you do right, but not what you you bring to the market what impact you you do or you bring to the people right, and my goal is actually to whatever I find in the research to actually also bring to the people. I mean that's one of Welcome to the third edition of the Beginner's Mind Year in Review Recordings, where we reflect on the past year and look forward to the coming one. I think in the third year, I can start calling it a tradition. Before Christmas, I invite speakers from previous episodes and partners of the podcast to reflect on the last year and give an outlook on the coming one. Between the Western New Year and the Chinese New Year, each speaker gets their own episode as a starter into a successful future. I'm your host, Christian Soschner, and I'm excited to bring you the sixth conversation in the series of 2022. Joining me today is Dr. Colin Ewald, founder and president of the Swiss Society for Aging Research and head of the Extracellular Matrix Regeneration Laboratory at the Department of Health Sciences and Technology at the ETH Zürich. Colin is a leading expert in the molecular biology of healthy aging and age-related pathologies and has received multiple awards for his work, including a recognition as a future entrepreneur and a spot on the list of the world's top 1,000 longevity leaders. Today, we will be discussing the Everett Lab's recent work on the expression of extracellular matrix genes during aging, the role of the mTOR kinase in aging, and the challenges of bridging gaps in longevity research between scientific disciplines and languages. So, Sit back, relax, and let's dive into the world of longevity research with Dr. Colin Ewald. Hi, Colin. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. How are you doing? Great. Uh, I admire you've been sitting there for the whole time. No break, no nothing. So I think you're doing great there. <laughs> <laughs> no break yet. Let's see. We have uh, one and a half hour to go. So it's uh, it's over. It's over Zoom. Colin, how is life in in Switzerland these days? It's, it, it, I would say it's good. We had lots of snow here in Zurich a couple of days ago, and now it gets really warm, which I don't like because uh, I will go skiing and snowboarding over Christmas. And now the snow is melting and I'm getting really, really worried. <laughs> but you know, these are you know minor problems, but still I look so, forward to the holidays. Summer is coming back in Switzerland over the holidays. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it also in Vienna on the better forecast that we get 10, 11, 12 degrees. Yeah, we're 14 it's here in London today. And last week we were, I prefer the colder weather as well, Colin. <laughs> it's a bit warm. It, it's really amazing because it was always it was minus degrees, right? We had minus eight, minus ten, minus three, and now it's warming up again. It's just, right, Colin, what were your highlights in twenty twenty two? Well, you know, as an academic researcher, of course, my highlights are you know publishing really cool papers. <laughs> what was your coolest paper? <laughs> The coolest paper was actually one that took nine years to get out and publish, right? So these are these journeys you do as an academic. So as we started in 2013 and looking how we, when you reduce um, mTOR signaling, which is better known, like if you take a truck like rapamycin, right? Mm -hmm. the mTOR kinase is really important for aging and longevity. And, uh, you know, people are, some people are already taking it, right? And 
there's a lot of research done on, on, on that important kindness. And we know that reduce, uh, reduce tour signaling, you know, you activate out of phage, which is recycling. But one part was not understood is like, you, you know, you also reduce protein translation. And so we, it took us really nine years to figure out how that actually works and how the mTOR uh, downregulation signals across uh, cell types, right? Because you look at whole organism. So um, we figured out then that there's a special pathway activated and actually works to hydrogen sulfate which is really surprising, right? And so this hydrogen sulfate actually signals across tissue and gives you all the health benefits, um, which we can maybe talk later a little bit more. But that was really, you know, a long winding road down, lots of dead ends, and really happy that Finish managed and we were finally able to publish it. It's nine years, nine years, how, 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 how? How was the work process to keep motivated for nine years to keep the work behind the publication going? Yeah, you know, I started this as a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard. And um, we just, everything looked good, but, you know, you want to figure out, you want to figure out the mechanism, right? And always you think like, ah, just a little bit more, this experiment, <laughs> that experiment, then you, you, then you have it, right? And you, you just keep on it and come up with new ideas. And I was almost giving up on it uh, until I met another researcher, Alvin Longchamp. He is at the University of Lausanne. He is a, he's a clinician. And he said, you know, I think it's working through this uh, transcription factor, ATF4, which is an activation transcription factor, really important for homeostasis, right? And I said, yeah, all right. You know what? I prepared the experiment. I bring it over to your lab. You know, it's only a short train ride, about three hours from Zurich to Lausanne. You guys try to do the experiments and it just worked out and everything started to fall in place. And so that's why you get the new shoop into, into these kind of projects and, and move it forward across the finish line. Uh, Kimberly, what's going on uh, in the longevity research at the UCL? Do you have uh, also a specialization in that area? I, I do not, not in our, not in our horizon portfolio. That's why I'm really interested to hear more about um, your work, Colin, and, and what you're doing. Um, and really nine years, I was going to say that sort of, that takes a lot of um, patience and dedication to keep, keep that going. So really interesting that this researcher has, another researcher um, sort of inspired you to keep, keep going. Yeah. And, and so that's also how science works, right? Because you, talk with other scientists and during the pandemic there was you know it's not really happening now finally we have meetings and conference again and exchange ideas right and you know you struggle with something and suddenly somebody has a cool idea but i'm you know i'm i'm also curious you know what why you think there is no you know you know um uh, way late to aging research in 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 in, in your areas or, you know, why, why do you ask? Because I think aging research is coming more and more up, right? And there are different programs there. And so I just curious also to hear from you. So I can ask questions. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we, we do have our Institute of Healthy Aging at UCL. So we do have a lot of research. And I think there is, um, there is more and more happening in that space. And I think especially if we're looking at we're living longer and sort of that impact as well. So there is, uh, you know, there is research, research funding in that space of that impact. I think there's an economic impact that research, you know, that where research funding is looking at that as well. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, it's increasingly, as you say, becoming more and more important. And so, 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 how are these topics selected? Is it you know public interest, or is it coming from the politicians, or how, or where does, or is it just the money flow? It's a lot of work goes in behind the scenes to prepare the work programs with with politicians, with bringing on experts. I think individuals and organizations and researchers themselves will lobby for funding a specific topic and then they do them for two years and 
Um, and hopefully, I think in the long term, uh, having that funding flow to build on those successes as well. I know that that's something more and more of a focus. They've got the commission has this mission oriented approach. Um, the one around health is more is on cancer, but it's sort of to try and link up these these projects and build and support each other building on as well. So I think I'm really keen to see more research more funding that supports sort of those next phases of development are continuing what we've got on. But yeah, just um, a lot of a lot of work in the backdrop on the European Commission side to pull together those topic areas. And one more thing I wanted to ask, because I'm just curious, you know, you mentioned interdisciplinary research, right? And from my side, I've, you know, Work. I'm a I'm a biologist, right? And uh, ETH Zurich, it's a technical university. We have lots of engineers, right? And so, for me as a biologist, talking to engineers or talking to mathematicians, because we also had a paper, we had computation, we had mathematics, we had engineering, we had physics, and we had biology, right? And and the, and they're completely different languages. So it's like you know me speaking you know German, the other person was speaking French. Or so it's just it's completely different language, a completely different mindset. How do you bridge these, and how do you translate and start the communication between the different disciplines? It's a really good point, and it's somewhat I would say part of what I do. I've done it a lot on the cross sector element. So when businesses approach us. Um, and how to connect. So we get pitch decks and I say, can you, instead of a pitch deck, can you give me a paragraph of what you want to do or what the research is? And then you can send this to, and I will send the pitch deck still to academics, but, and then across disciplines as well. Um, I've done less of the, the less of the mixing across disciplines directly as I've done more on the cross sector, which is, and is learning the different languages. Um, but I, yeah, I, it, it's challenging. Um, and I think when, when my team, they help put these proposals together, I think we have a common language that has to be applied in these instances for what we're involved in, which is the e European, the EU language. So it's sort of, you bring in everyone's different languages and then we try and help put it together into an EU proposal and this sort of EU language. Um, I think that's one way where we're doing that, but it, it, it's definitely a challenge. Have you, no, can I ask a question? Have you been involved in any sort of European collaborations or funding? Yeah, you know, it got really difficult for Switzerland, right? Oh, of course, sorry. <laughs> there's some, there's some, uh, we have a sort of special connection on, on that point. Yeah, no, I wish. And it's really sad um, to see that, that, you know, you know, I mean, it's a great loss for Switzerland, also for research, and I think also vice versa. I think the communication between uh, the European uh, and, and the Swiss research institution um, should be established again. Um, but I, I'm not following that closely anymore. <laughs> That's more of it what I'm following more closely. And we have a nice, we collaborate a lot with ETH Zurich and a number of other Swiss institutions. And so we've got sort of between the UK and the Switzerland at the moment, there's a um, a shared challenge and, and understanding. Yeah, but coming back to your question, I you know, there is this um, extra matrix and aging um, network that's also coming from an aging network coming also from the UK. And there I'm acting as an advisor on the advisory board. And, you know, coming up with these initiatives, what I learned, it's very hard to state the mission statement, right? Where's, you know, first you do this gap analysis, where, where's the gap in knowledge? And then you try to formulate the mission statement, given with all the expertise and leverage you have from the individual groups, right? And so I think this is, this is very challenging to, to move this forward. But talking about longevity research, what were the big breakthroughs in the longevity research that uh, you saw in 2022? Besides uh, your your great research, where is uh, uh, the this area heading to? Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly not so happy with the longevity um, research because it's at the moment still there is no clear vision or where to go and. Uh, you know, also for the assessment of the different findings, because I mean, there are really cool breakthroughs, right? Mm -hmm. 
but sometimes you know the way it's read out or or how the claims made are a little bit too um too high they, they claiming too much for what what they deliver right or based on you know some of these findings so i wish there was would be more um time or you know incentive to actually do a little bit better job um having said that you know there are so many uh, interesting area coming out i mean we had these uh, nine hallmarks of aging that were mm -hmm. defined in 2013 really um say what what the different aging processes are all about and lately more and more research realized that you know there are not only nine hallmarks of aging of course right and there are more and so you know more and more research gets gets into actually providing new hallmarks or you know things to work on and and for anybody to understand hallmarks of aging is a, is a concept so you can easily understand what what what's going on about it and so in the cancer field for example it really started to to bloom when the hallmarks of cancer were defined right because once you have a hallmark you have a framework to to work with and so for the aging it's you know there are these um damages to different parts of uh, for example, proteins or DNA, right? So these are more the causes of aging and then the consequences for your cells or for your body, right? And so I think, you know, in 2000, yeah, this year, I think there are new and new more voices were lifted that, you know, there's more and more to come, which is exciting, right? Which just expands the whole horizon um, and, and things to to work on. And that also helps, you know, not only academic researchers, but also helps, you know, um, startups, for example, right? Because you see like, oh, this is a very important area to work in, on or in. And then how can you apply or solve that solution, right? And so that is also then coming more there. What what are the, I'm curious now, what are the nine hallmarks of, of aging? So the first one, um, you know, is, you know, the DNA, um, <clears throat> The genome instability, right? Mm -hmm. So the DNA, how it packed, and are on the end of the DNA, there are these telomerases where uh, these are like in your shoelaces, if you know the knots in the shoelaces. And so if they go off, then then your shoelaces go all really, right? And something like similar happens to your uh, chromosomes, right? Which is your, your genome, right? Because every time you cell divides, it has to pack it again and then unpack it, right? And so these are important. You lose always a little bit of these telomerases. And then, so that's damage to, to the DNA itself, but then the DNA has to be also read and that's called um, epigenetic regulation, which mm -hmm. is standing on top of it, right? And so that's this, you have your blueprint, but also environment is important. If you go and do exercise, right? The epigenome will be changed, adapting to the stress from the exercise, right? And so the, that's the epigenetic regulation that's also lost. And then you go further on to out of the DNA, right? The message is getting out there, which gives you the proteins, right? And all those proteins have to maintain. They are like the building blocks, the enzymes that function in your body or the structural things. And those ones also have to be um, hold together. And then you go further out into your cell, you have organelles like the mitochondria, which is the powerhouses, right? Mm -hmm. They also decline. So your energy metabolism declines. That has important things for um nutrient sensing which is another hallmark there and on, on the hormonal uh, balance and then also your cells can become senescent so cells have a limit how many times they can divide also depending on the telomerases and that's the senescence and those cells actually accumulate in your body and also release you know other factors are not good it's like having a rotten apple around all apples so the rotten apple would get the other ones also you know become more rotten right so so that's the analogy of these um, senescent cells which are zombie cells and then um they of course are you know between the tissues or tissue maintenance are the stem cells right so the stem cells start to exhaust so you cannot regenerate your mm -hmm. tissue and then the communication between the tissues I think I have not understood that all nine hallmarks <laughs> more or less try to um, from the heroic side. And so you could technically start to address anything, right? So if you could, you know, it, it, it maintain your stem cells for be better, right? Or 
this maintenance better, then you could regenerate the tissue for longer and you could, of course, then live longer, right? Your skin could be younger for longer. If you get rid of senescent cells, you know, um, that also um, helps. And so the def definition of these hormones is usually that um, it has to, you know, if, if it's gone, it has to accelerate the aging process. Mm -hmm. But if you give it back, you can accurate, you can slow aging, right? And usually in mice, you want to see then it can extend the, the lifespan of, of the mice. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, these are the definitions. What is, what is possible currently when we think about extending the lifespan uh, with, with uh, the existing technology? <sighs> so okay if, if you're a cell or a mouse then <laughs> we can do a lot of things right we can rejuvenate you <laughs> completely right mm -hmm. and uh and extend your lifespan um so far you know we're still on the translational side to humans so at the moment for us it's unfortunate whatever your grandma said you know to exercise eat right sleep right all those things uh, is at the moment the next steps are actually um supplements you know mm. because you know they're not regulated but also on the other side they haven't really been proven in clinical trials yet right and hopefully then you know one day we will have or like maybe in five ten years we would have drugs that would slow aging at the moment there's one of the uh, drugs that is is good it's called met metformin which is mm -hmm. a type 2 diabetes drug and researchers like Neil Barsla use that to uh do a proof concept a concept trial in a sense that because you know if you think about aging aging is not a disease and so how would you run this through a clinical trial where you have to target the disease okay so now um there's lots of back and forth going in the field is very active and the FDA now agreed that we could measure time to event like how long would it take to get Alzheimer's disease or, or dementia or cardiovascular problems or, or type 2 diabetes, right? So all these comorbidity discordant diseases that come up with aging, right? How long would it take it on, on placebo and how long would it take it on a longevity drug like metformin, right? So this time to invent. And so hopefully those trials will start soon and would have a blueprint to run actually clinical trials because, you know, also, our lab does research and we predict drugs that could that extend lifespan in model organism, right? But then you want to have we want to actually translate that, and you know you still have to go to um, clinical trials if you want to do anything in the biotech sector or you know something important. That and then the last step would be yeah, go ahead. It would be good to have a proof in a clinical trial. I still have a hard time to figure out uh, to just uh, think through how how can a clinical trial work. I mean, the claim that I read very often or I see very often on LinkedIn, for example, Christian Angermeyer posts frequently about longevity, is that it clearly extends the lifespan uh, until infinity. So basically, you can live forever and decide when to end your life, uh, which would be a nice thing uh, to live for four hundred years and then say, okay, I had a good four hundred four centuries and it's off. But how will you translate it in a clinical trial? I mean, this 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 would be long-running studies, basically. You would go for a study of 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 very difficult. At the moment, the way to move forward is that you take people that are, you know, around 70, 75, and a little bit uh, frail. So mm. frail means, you know, the, 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 how fast they walk, the physical performance. And so they're really close to getting one of these age-related diseases. And then you just choose a window of five years, which is still a long time and costs a lot of money. Um, but that's at the moment uh, the, the way forward, at least what I've seen. Um, other than that, you just go by, if you have, if you know your target, right, you go by a disease or you can go by an orphan disease or something mm. like that. You can still go the classical way. <clears throat> and, but, you know, the challenge really is all these biotechs also um, that, you know, are in the space to have anything, a therapeutic intervention or a medication, um, they fail actually by at the, the clinical trial um, kind of thing because, you know, it's it's the design on one part and there's no real good good blueprint that's the the the, the biggest challenge uh at the moment 
Kimberly, I, f- I forgot to say <laughs> say say goodbye. Uh, do you want to stay a couple of minutes or do you want to drop off? <laughs> Maybe I'll just, I just have one question actually for Colin mm-hmm. and then if you don't mind, I'll, then I'll drop off. But you mentioned supplements, which was quite interesting because it's it's not regulated the way drugs, well, it's not regulated, I think most places. And so it's, has there been a lot of interest kind of in the field from um companies or around supplements in this space that are in touch with with you or researchers in this area yes there's um there's huge interest again because that's the fastest you can bring um to the consumer to the market right and i have to uh, say disclaimer here i i'm a co-founder of of a supplement company and some research uh is actually spun out of my lab which you know which is pretty i'm, I'm pretty excited about um so you know, you know, and and I tell you the reason from an academic side why I decided to do this because as an academic, um, you know, you you do your research, which is great. You ask big questions; um, it's very exciting. And then you publish it, and it gets to a paper, and the paper will be you know collecting dust after a couple of years because you know this. But it's like a news article, it's right? At the beginning, and then it's, it just collects dust, right? And people will use the knowledge, of course, to move it forward. But usually, in the, the last sentence of the paper is that we, with this, we could, you know, solve this and that problem, right? But the traditional part is never really done. And there, that's the, re- the reason is because there's no, no incentive for an academic researcher to, to translate anything. Because, you know, you as an academic, you're judged by the high impact papers you do, right? But not what you you bring to the market, what impact you you do or you bring to the people, right? And my goal is actually to whatever I find in the research to actually also bring to the people. I mean, that's one of my main goals. And so we've done huge screens with different drugs, and we stumbled actually in those screens at, at the supplement at the compound that increased um, the lifespan of sea organs, and it also um, promoted the the collagen, so the proteins outside the cell, the homeostasis. So the turnover rate is actually declining during aging, and we show shown that actually it promotes it, right? So it made it made it really interesting. And so I had the decision to face either, you know, I, I you know I write it up, submit it, and it's out, right? Nothing will happen. But I thought, you know, this this looks too good to be true. I will I want to try it. But the problem is, as an academic researcher, you, you cannot do this. So you have to um, start find people to you know, do the company and in the supplement space, um, it's really important that you have, you know, a really good team that promotes it forward also to, you know, do the whole public relation and everything like that. So I was actually happy to, as a scientist, so, okay, can move the science forward and then spin it out. And so we went, went on to patent it and now it's spinned out and it will be released, um, I think, end of this year, um, which is which is really cool to to see really from from the bench to bedside is the wrong word, but you know, to to the people. You mentioned your spin out. Uh, so you're in the process of spinning out the technology into a company. Uh, Kimberly, sorry, I forget, I forget again. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I think I, I have to drop off now, but thank you. So I mean, that was really interesting and I'm, congratulations on the spin out. And um, also just to note that that's actually a really uh, selling factor in getting yourself collaborative grants in the EU is sort of also for having that company, that expertise and, and spin out. So I'll leave it at there and to, to keep carrying on. But thank you so much both. It was great to chat and Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Kivoli, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. It was good to have you on the show. <laughs> thank See you. Bye. Bye. Pauline. Your spin out. Uh, are you already um, ready to talk about details? What the spin out uh, is all about? Uh, what's your goal? Yeah, with the I, mean, I, I, I can't <laughs> to to a certain extent, right? <laughs> um, I don't want to take away the the thunder or the fire or what you mm-hmm. want to say, but um, you, you know, it's actually a compound that's that's an, an activator of you know collagen homeostasis which mm-hmm. really is one of the biggest challenge you excel matrix that declines during aging you see with the skin the sacking and the wrinkles right and um you know the only way i am aware of to rejuvenate or you know make this useful is when you do damage to it because if you do damage to the excel matrix right it will start to repair but that only works to a certain extent so having found you know a supplement that will uh, do this is is really cool 
um, to see because it's not only the collagen, it's not only in your skin, but also in, in your internal organs, right? So you assume that whatever you see on decay coming in the skin, you also have insight and to both, both to this is actually really, um, really cool. And so, I'm we need to do a podcast when you when you are completed with a spin out process. So I hope that you are already uh, there. Um, what maybe I ask you one question? What was your biggest learning uh, in spin out? So when an academic has an idea and says, "Okay, we want to spin something out," um, and he comes to you and um, wants to discuss and talk with you, uh, how you how you how you did it? Uh, what were the challenges? Uh, what was easy? What was difficult? Uh, which advice would you give uh, to this researcher? Well, you know, first of all, nothing is easy. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, for research, I mean, um, so if you, if an academic researcher comes to me, I say a postdoc or a PhD student, I say I want to spin out something. I wrote actually a review with um, um, Tobias Reichmuth about uh, the 10 simple rules to start a successful um, spin-off company. <laughs> <laughs> Ten commandments. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, so first of all, the, the academic or the researcher mindset is completely different than the business mindset, right? And so you have, as a researcher, first have to learn something about business, right? If you have never done that, you have to understand what it means to um, go fast to the market, right? So I mean, that means also you research what you do and has to be really focused because usually in academia, you start somewhere and then, oh, this is interesting, you go this way or this way, right? But you have to really stay on target. And so that that that's one thing you have you have to learn and just you know be very focused, right? Um to make is that is that is that such a huge difference in this these two mindsets? I, I think so, yeah. And it's it's really the discussion and the openness and learning uh, something because it's just it's just these sort of things. I mean, sometimes you use the same words, but you completely mean something different, right? Because I mean, for an academic researcher, what is my incentive to put out research instead of doing good things? But I, as a researcher, care a lot what other people think of me, right? My peers, right? Do they think it's really cool innovation? This is novel. Is it exciting, right? So what do other people think? I mean, and that's completely different. What you know, mm -hmm. you know, a CEO mindset will be, right? So, you know, you want to, you have a vision, you want to drive it forward. In, in a sense, you have, you know, maybe the same mission to do something good, but you know, also other incentive. You want to, you know, commercialize things, right? Which is completely different to making something really cool and novel and the coolest technique. Yeah, and, I think also, and also have to learn, you know, what what the consumer wants or needs, right? There's no need to make something super super cool and fancy, which consumer won't understand. And it's not. Um, I, I mean, I see this, but I think the. I mean, I can say the company is called Avea Life, um, mm -hmm. and the team is is really good. I mean, you know, we have these discussions where I come with my science statements, and they come back like. It's way too complicated, right? <laughs> and so we try to really like simplify the language to give the same meaning um, to to what it is actually, right? And to to make it understandable. And that that's a skill I think researchers also lack in a sense to also to sell it, right? In a in a sense. Yeah, I had Albert Miespichler earlier today on a podcast. He is in the process of pivoting from P2P to B2C in diagnostics. And he also said something similar. He said the biggest challenge now is uh, to translate the scientific language, which was tailored for the B2P world, now into the B2C world. And uh, one of his comments was, uh, nobody in the B2C world reads more than three sentences. So you need to say everything that's relevant in three sentences. Yeah, I saw that one. That was really uh, impressive to me to uh, to hear this, and uh, it just resonates very well, right? It's just, yeah. And I mean, do you we have this elevator pitch? You have your fifteen seconds to put it down and put it into perspective and make it interesting, right? In a sense. When is the big launch planned for your new company? The, the company is already launched, so they are already on the market. Uh, so to bring that pro our product onto the market will be, I think, end of this this year. 
so soonish. Um, <laughs> oh, it's uh, only two weeks left, so it's really yeah. soonish. <laughs> yeah, it's only two weeks left, and so this is really a new kind of uh, of supplement, which is which is which is exciting uh, to to come out. And you know, the thing is, for me as a researcher, I know it's safe. So we also have done all these experiments in mice, mm-hmm. and we actually done the experiments in very old mice. Because, you know, usually those experiments are done in young mice and they're very resilient, right? And, you know, and their old person or mouse is completely different because all these defense mechanisms don't work so well anymore. And so these old mice, um, you know, we, we, we give them to the old mice, they improve their frailty. So they this preclinical assessment, they have better crib strength and, mm-hmm. you know, vitality. And you see this health pyramid, which is really exciting uh, and rewarding to see, actually, right? Um, that's great to hear that's good to hear um in the last minute uh time flies <laughs> this, is, this is a big problem with this podcast uh with interesting speakers uh it just goes by in no time um one final question predictions for 2023 in the longevity space in your area of research where what what will we see in 2023 besides your new company <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of work done on uh, rejuvenation in a sense, Mm -hmm. right? So with these um, Yamanaka factors, and I think hopefully we we find something, another approach to do the same thing. But clearly what is needed is not only to stone of aging, but also the regeneration of of tissue or even whole organs. And I I hope that more cool research will come out uh, in, in that area. Yeah, hopefully it would be interesting to see, to come really to that point, like Christian Angermeyer says, that uh, human beings can decide how long they want to live. Would be a good thing. Colin, let me pull in the next speaker for a brief introduction. Um, it's Guido Guardoni from... Don't miss out on valuable insights and information. Hit the subscribe button now to stay updated on our latest episodes and join our growing community of like-minded individuals. Your support helps us reach more people who can benefit from the content. Show your support by liking, commenting, and sharing the episodes. Thank you for being part of our journey.